On the eve of the trial for Elijah McLean's death, we remember the Coloradans who would not forget what happened to him. They are the reason a trial is happening. Power is in the people. I think that is the biggest lesson. Colorado's Republican Party says if it can't have a primary with Trump, it won't have a primary at all. What's the holdup with Denver citywide compost program? It rolled out in January and most people still don't have their bids. It has to be methodical. It has to be thoughtful. It has to be patient. And a decoy sunflower patch is planted to attract all the influencers going to snap selfies. So hopefully they won't trample the farmer's fields. That's tonight on Next. A jury being picked now will decide what is justice for Elijah McLean's death four years ago. Tomorrow will be final jury selection and likely opening statements. We would not have reached a trial, would not have reached this point, if not for the protesters who brought attention to how McLean died in the custody of Aurora police. Here's Mark Salinger. Elijah McLean. Before his name was chanted throughout protests in 2020, his case seemed all but closed. Elijah died after police stopped him, put him in a carotid hold, then paramedics injected him with ketamine. He had done nothing wrong when police stopped him while walking home. Four years later, the officers involved in his death are now on trial. To understand how we got here, we start in November of 2019 less than three months after his death. I think overall the officers did a good job. The Aurora police chief applauded the officer's work. The district attorney declined to file charges against the officers. The initial autopsy listed the cause of death as undetermined. Then the George Floyd protests of 2020 brought Elijah's name to the streets. Everything that you've seen has been a direct result of the protests. Candace Bailey was one of the first who told protesters who showed up for George Floyd about Elijah McLean. Without those protests, without leadership, there never would have been the things that we are seeing today. For months, they chanted his name through the streets. In July of 2020, the state attorney general opened an investigation into the case the district attorney had already declined to file charges in. One of the things that protests do is call it the attention to the community, to let the community know we're standing for something that we do not believe is right. Bishop Jerry Demmer is with the Greater Denver Ministerial Alliance. If you never make any noise, if you never make a challenge, then it's like business as usual. So I think the protests had everything to do that these police now are going to have to go to trial and be charged. It wasn't until September of 2021, more than two years after Elijah died, that a grand jury convened by the Attorney General brought charges against the Aurora police officers. How did we get here today? How did we get here? Well, the grand jury said it wasn't done right. Four years, protests, and a commitment to never stop saying his name. Power is in the people. I think that is the biggest lesson. For months before the 2020 protests, Elijah's family and close friends held their own protests at Aurora, but few people showed up. It wasn't until George Floyd was killed that hundreds of thousands of people took to the streets for protesting for racial justice. The organizers of those protests all agree that social pressure is why we're preparing to start a trial this week for those two officers accused of killing Elijah McClain. And change has already come to the Aurora Police Department before this trial. Yes, yeah, so Aurora Police is now under consent decree with an independent monitor looking at their every move, trying to instill change, parts of which were because of the Elijah McClain case. Justice looks different for everyone in this yeah. case, but we have already seen some tan tangible changes to the police department. Mark Salinger, thank you. Colorado Republicans now have the go-ahead from a judge to join the court fight over whether Donald Trump will appear on Colorado's primary ballot, though the state party has signaled that if the judge rules against them, they will not comply. As first reported by our partners at Colorado Politics, the Republican Party Central Committee is scheduled to meet at the end of the month to consider a proposal to opt out of the 2024 primary. They would instead pick their candidate through a caucus and assembly process. That would give about 3,000 Republican Party insiders the power to select a primary candidate. And now, one of the nation's most prominent election deniers is backing up the Colorado GOP's push to opt out of open primaries as well. Former Arizona gubernatorial candidate Carrie Lake says that opting out here in Colorado will safeguard the nomination from outside influences. For months, the Colorado GOP has been trying to limit primary participation to block unaffiliated from being a part of it. So they're also suing Democratic Secretary of State Jenna Griswold in an effort to keep unaffiliated voters out of the GOP primary. The Colorado Republican Party's deal with the Colorado Libertarian Party is aging like a month-old tuna fish sandwich. 
That agreement was supposed to keep libertarian candidates out of the Republicans' toughest races, making it easier for the Republican to win. Well, don't you know there is now a libertarian in the Republicans' toughest House race, which will be defending Congresswoman Lauren Boebert's seat. This weekend, the Libertarian Party announced that they have a candidate to challenge Boebert, saying she would not sign their pledge. Libertarians are requiring Republicans, a party with 30 times as many voters in Colorado, to pledge that they will work to abolish the FBI and CIA, eliminate the Department of Education, and dismantle the military draft, among other demands. Last year, Boebert won her seat by just 546 votes in a race that did not have a Libertarian candidate. Her new Libertarian challenger, James Wiley, says if he's elected, he will work to, quote, rapidly dismantle the federal government. Castle Rock town leaders are going to get an earful again tonight from citizens who want restrictions on Pride Fest events. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. That was last month when town council agreed to take up the issue of new public indecency restrictions. Castle Rock council has been divided over these calls to restrict or ban Pride events, but they did vote unanimously to review the town code, which currently does not address public indecency or indecent exposure. State law already addresses those issues, and we should point out toplessness is not illegal in Colorado. Courts have held that. Tonight, Castle Rock Council will consider a proposal to make public indecency, public nudity, or indecent exposure a municipal offense that would give their local courts the power to hand out fines or jail time. Town Council will also consider holding event organizers responsible criminally if there's any kind of public indecency at their events at town facilities. So there's a race on in Denver. Which will happen first? So the leaves are going to fall and they'll need to be composted. Or will the city finally deliver people the compost bins that were first promised at the beginning of the year? Our Marshall Zellinger explains why most people in Denver still have yet to get those compost bins. The good news for Valerie? Her green lawn in Baker is small enough that mowing doesn't take long. I love to garden and have a nice backyard, and I create a lot of organic waste back here. The bad news for Valerie, her green compost bin that all Denver residents will be getting is non-existent. A lot of it can go in compost, and it's currently still going in the trash. <laughs> this is our backyard that has many, 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 many branches, trees, leaves, weeds, flowers, dead flowers that need to be deadheaded and I have no place to put them anytime. Tom turned in his larger trash bin for a smaller, cheaper one once Denver started charging a fee in January for waste collection. And so we turned it in thinking we were going to be into a really small one, thinking we were going to get a compost bin. We don't want to just drop off 150,000 carts and say, OK, figure out what goes in there. It's a new service for a lot of people. Nina Weisdorf is not the enemy for those of you still waiting for your green compost bins. She's just responsible for rolling out the program responsibly. So this one we tagged earlier. Um, so we found that there was a bag of dog poop in there. She spent part of her morning in the city park neighborhood searching through people's carts. And we're checking for contamination. And then we're if we find it, we're educating the residents. We're leaving a tag so they know what was in the wrong cart. You know, it's an educational tool. And then we're turning it around so that the driver doesn't collect a contaminated card. That is why you don't have your compost bin yet. So far, only residents in Solid Waste Collection District 2, City Park, and north to Globeville, Elyria, Swansea. Next up is District 4, Montbello, and Green Valley Ranch. The city expects the bin rollout to take three months for each district. So starting in the new year, that would take us through the next couple, you know, through 2025 to get through the remaining eight districts. I mean, I'm still excited. It's just like, Come on now, guys. <laughs> Until the bins are delivered, residents get a $3 a month credit on their new solid waste fee. And I don't really you know, care so much about the money as I care about the convenience. Before this year, any resident could pay extra for a compost bin. I think one of them might be in this studio right now. The next three districts to get compost bins delivered, Northeast Denver and Southwest Denver, are the areas that have had the fewest buying them ahead of time prior to this year. Out of 176,000 households that will get compost bins, Kyle, only 41,000 have them right now. The few, few, the proud, the composters. No, I mean, I don't know. I've got gardens. I've been on this train for, for a long time. It is a learning process, and part of this deal is that they're restricting what previous composters can put into the system because they want to simplify it for people at the start, at least. And that's part of this education program, uh, yard waste and food, yard scraps and food waste, maybe food scraps and yard, I'm saying it wrong. Sure. Food and yard stuff. Yeah. 
Tell you what, if somebody throws a bag of dog business into my compost. You know that person didn't do that. No, it was somebody passing by. It was yeah. somebody passing by in the alley. Don't do that. I'll find you. Marshall, thank you. Sunflower photos were wildly popular, and they still are. And so folks were absolutely going and trespassing. And Farmers, so sick of photographers and influencers trampling their sunflowers. They got a decoy field planted in Adams County. A look at whether Colorado's largest polluters will just be able to buy their way out of the rules. And tonight, a suburban city may declare a state of emergency over the sound of paddle whacking. The latest battle in the war on pickleball. Next. The people in charge of Colorado's air quality say that just 18 companies are responsible for 15% of the state's industrial pollution. This week, regulators are finalizing new rules to crack down on that handful of companies. The state's Air Quality Control Commission has been ordered to cut greenhouse gas emissions from some of the state's biggest companies like Molson Coors and Suncor. They're trying to get the companies to meet state-mandated targets like dropping greenhouse gas emissions 20% before 2030. The state is proposing a credit system where some companies could get credits for making reductions in their pollution, and then they could sell those credits to polluters who are not meeting the standards. Environmental groups say the plan is too complicated and gives polluters an easy out if they can just pay money. The companies who would be impacted by these rules aren't too thrilled about it either. They say the plan is too strict and it could force them to lay off workers or scale back production. Pleasing no one, what are they, meteorologists? Oh, hey now. I'm just saying, there's always somebody who's upset with you, no matter whether it's sun or rain, somebody is, I was going to say a bad word, uh, somebody <laughs> is something or rather at you about uh -huh. it. Yeah. Just typing away on their mm -hmm. computer, sending me that email. I hear you, I see you. Uh, you know what, we are tracking a few scattered showers and thunderstorms. We need the rain, right? We'll take it because they're going to be few and far between and then the sunshine returns to us really throughout the rest of this week. As we look across downtown Denver, off in the distance, out toward the foothills, that's where you kind of have those darker skies. A better shot for seeing some storms, certainly. Up in the mountains and foothills for us this afternoon, a little bit of light snowfall across the San Juans. Lake City looking at some light rain showers, a rumble of thunder. There are those dark, ominous skies laying down a little bit of light rain out toward Conifer. Otherwise, one rogue cell in Arapahoe County is tracking off to the east. Within the next about three hours, that's going to be our best window for, to potentially see maybe one or two more thunderstorms. They're going to be so brief. Couple of sprinkles, some gusty winds, and then they're long gone. By about 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, a beautiful start to the day. Clouds will be increasing up in the high country, but look at this. Storms few and far between up in the foothills, and then they're long gone. They're out of here by tomorrow evening. Temperatures once again back into the lower 80s. It has been a beautiful week so far with more wonderful weather on the way. We'll be sitting in the mid to upper 80s off to the eastern plains, 70s up in the high country. And if yes, you were saying, no, I'm sick of the summer heat, bring on fall. Well, we'll officially welcome in the fall season on Saturday. Temperatures will cool off after a cold front arrives. This will bring the high country a better chance of storms for us just to cool off mid 70s for the weekend. But the 80 degree heat is back next week. May I make a recommendation? Something that is not our work, but I think is worth your time. It's a book, Go is a River, by first-time Colorado author Shelley Reed. It's the story of a young woman who's growing up decades ago in a male-dominated, often racist small town in Colorado in the 1940s and 50s. The book is set primarily at her family's peach orchard in the real-life town of Iola, which was abandoned and flooded to make way for Blue Mesa Reservoir. I had never heard about it until I read Go as a River. It is a novel with a beautiful sense of place in the Gunnison Valley. And it's a story about how people shape the natural world and how they shape each other's lives. This is a really great read, especially if you can pick it up before the end of peach season. We're going to put a link with info on the book in the next section of 9news.com. The beauty of a sunflower field is, is, is stunning. And we in agriculture are really blessed that we get to see that in our backyards. And the backyard thing is kind of the problem with Adams County sunflower fields, because getting to those fields meant trampling through somebody else's property. Until now, a new public attraction invites the photo ops. Give me that Newsmax style scare the heck out of people graphic. New developments in the war on pickleball. Notice how the video gets more dramatic and different every night. Well, it is going to be a dramatic night in Centennial. City Council may declare pickleball an emergency in order to fast-track rules to ban new outdoor courts within 100 feet of homes. They could also require courts within 600 feet of homes to put up noise dampeners. They also will consider an 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. pickleball curfew. 
We will have boots on the ground covering this latest front in the war on pickleball with updates at 9 and 10. Influencers on social media started the trend and then normies joined in. Sunflower selfies. It meant people were often trespassing on private property to take those sunflower photos at sunset, sometimes driving their cars right into farmers' fields. Our Brian Wendland takes us to a unique decoy set up in Adams County. It's the end of summer and sunflowers are trending. Who doesn't want a picture with all these beautiful little sunnies in the background? They are iconic. The perfect backdrop for a viral TikTok. It's actually kind of unusual that before noon we don't have other folks out here. But Jennifer Tucker says that popularity is a problem for Adams County farmers. So one of our Adams County producers had to hire and have two Adams County Sheriff's deputies stand guard basically of his field. They, they, they were on rotation keeping folks out of his field. So with a little prodding from a county commissioner and a little help from CSU Extension, Tucker and company have grown a public sunflower field at the Riverdale Animal Shelter. And I think that's probably the big key thing here is, is we get to bring a little taste of, of the beauty that we have out on the plains. Um, right here into town. Eventually, Tucker hopes to have more fields spread around the county. But right now, getting anyone to take a photo here instead of trespassing is a win. If we can just take a little bit of the stress off the farmers that have the trespass problems, it'll be huge. She doesn't blame anyone for wanting to capture this beauty. It's been pretty darn popular. Social media has run with it. But now there are no excuses. You don't need to ruin a farmer's field to get internet famous. You just have to come to this public plot of paradise. For next, I'm Brian Wendland. Of course, the sunflowers don't last. You've probably only got another couple of weeks for that photo shoot. Then the decoy field's flowers will be harvested for bird seed or sunflower, fl sunflower oil. Aaron's back from vacation. Dropping feedback like it's hot. We'll have that next. The most Colorado thing we saw today is either ingenious or illegal, or perhaps it's both. Kelly Euling snapped this questionable toe situation in Walden. That would, that would appear to be a, uh, a forklift or a front loader carrying a Subaru down the road. Some Colorado ingenuity right there. If you see something that just screams this state to you, email it to us at next at 9news.com. Feedback about our book recommendation, Go is a River. Diane says, wonderful book. Thank you for spreading the word. Nadine says, sounds good, but nobody in Gunnison grows peaches. I, I know that, Nadine. It's fiction, all right? Just suspend disbelief for a moment and check out the book. I think that you will enjoy it. CS says, the city of Denver really screwed up the pay-as-you-go trash and compost. They weren't ready, but they started charging from the jump. It took months to get smaller trash cans. The credit they give monthly is not enough. They should have started the education process before they started the billing. Other than that, CS, how are you liking the service? No, I mean, understandably... In retrospect, it could have gone a lot smoother. And I like your idea of starting that education process earlier the next time we make one of these changes. Stephen Selvich writes into us tonight to say, pandering radical Democrat activist hack. You leftist scumbags have zero credibility. Stephen, something I'm working on these days with my girls, ages three and five, is that name calling is not a great way to solve problems. Please write back in and we'll try to solve your problem together. We'll see you next time.